Hi folks, can we make or do a DIY ROM repeat-o-meter? I think so. They are used, amongst other things, to find holes or low spots in surface plates. Take a look. You can see as they move it along the surface plate, what's happening is the dial indicator gauge on this is moving. How does that work? The way these are designed is we've got four feet, one, two, three feet, are on the left side of this flexure. The other is over here. You've got an indicator sticking up right here, as you can see in this photo. And so as you move it along, and these four feet cease to be coplanar because of a hole or a variation or a defect or problem or wear spot in a surface plate, you get movement on this indicator. Now these look fancy, and the truth is they do read out really precise, but there's no reason you couldn't also use even a relatively inexpensive tenths indicator, at least I think. We bought uh, a couple of these though on eBay. The last one I got, I got for $75. It's a one micron, a one UM, which if you do one UM to inches, it's the, one of those darned E numbers. So let's say 10 UMs, well 10 UMs would be four ten thousandths. So this is four tenths of, or one tenth of that, which I believe would mean it's 40 uh, millionths or four millionths. Yeah, really, really precise. But here's what I don't get. The gauge only, in other words, the machined steel body of these is $1,500. And I just thought, I, I don't get it. What am I missing here? I had the chance to use one at the Keith Rucker scraping class, and it's really fun. And it just seemed like a great tool to have around because, boy, rather than spending $400 or something to have surface plates calibrated, at least check them first on your own to decide if you need them calibrated. So there's three things I think that we do need to pay attention to. And what I'm excited for is I reached out to Tom Lipton, and he said, yeah, I'm happy to do a collaboration. So... We are going to send this video to Tom first, and Tom's going to take a look at our, our approach, our strategy, and offer us some design critiques, some improvements, some things that we need to consider as we go about making these. Number one, the feet. The feet on the product you would purchase, as you can see right here, are lapped carbide. So carbide is really darn hard. Um, I don't have an easy way, at least I don't think, of doing that. What I did do was find some McMaster car feet, $2 a piece press fit fixture supports that we can press in. And I emailed with Max McMaster and God, they're such a great company. And their response about whether they're hardened is yes, they're case hardened to Rockwell 55, 12L14. I think subject to Tom telling me I'm wrong, that that is plenty good for what we're going to be using this for. The second thing is this flexure. That's probably a really important thing. My plan is to cut it with a bandsaw. And to do that, we're gonna make, probably as a separate Wednesday widget, a guide jig for our bandsaw. That way we can use our, we've got kind of a fabricator's bandsaw that it tends to walk a little or not cut straight up and down. That's fine, not uncommon. So we're gonna make a jig and hopefully get both this flexure cut as well as this long cut here, uh, which separates as a spreader bar with the saw. What's funny though, if you look at the product that they sell, uh, look how rough this is. There, it doesn't seem to reek of precision machining or precision making here. So what, the, kind of what makes me think we can do this. What is this spreader bar right here? Why is there a slit along? Well, there's three forms of adjustment on these tools. Most coarse adjustment would be the height uh, of this quarter 20, just a regular old cap screw uh, relative to the plunger. The second is this wheel here. What that does is it's a spreader bar. And as you can see here, as I adjust it, it's increasing or decreasing the preload as between the indicator and the screw. There's also then a very fine adjust on the indicator itself, this little screw here in the bottom right. I can't figure out, <laughs> you're gonna make fun of me, I can't figure out how they did it. So what I've come up with is we'll buy this McMaster car thumb screw, quarter 20 thumb screw, and as we screw it down in, it's going to push against the hole in this b bottom part here that we've cut apart through. If we turn on a section view analysis here in Fusion 360, what you'll see is that the hole here is smaller so that when we push down or thread down with this quarter 20 screw, it's gonna, again, push up these two apart. But then I'm gonna drill and tap the thumb screw for a 440, but I'll put a washer on it, then 
when I back this screw up or out, it's going to cause them to want to, I think, pull apart. At least I hope that works. I'm hoping Tom can offer some insight on whether that's a good idea or perhaps there's a better way of doing it. Lastly, there are these sidebars, which are interesting. They're actually loose. And I think all they are meant to do is prevent from hyperflexing or sagging as you use the carry handle here or over here to carry it around. It just keeps, again, this small flexor joint right there from sagging, at least I think. Again, hoping Tom can add some insight there. So that's it. Let's talk about the feet. Let's talk about how we make uh, these two slots and then the overall design of the spreader bar and we'll see what he says so card here to Tom's rebuttal video or response video really looking forward to it and then after we get his feedback we're going to uh, make one of these finally though I'm also wondering should we make either a smaller one or make both sizes because right now this is about 12 inches left to right and that's great for a large surface plate but I thought I kind of want like a four or five inch one to do a smaller plate or just carry around. Boy, if you're at an auction, you could throw one of these in and check a plate before you bid on it. Kind of cool, right? I modeled up a smaller version of it. Easier, just as easy to make, less material. Doesn't seem like a big deal. And I had to laugh because I was watching Tom's video. And sure enough, you can see when they put this 12 inch repeat meter on a relatively small plate, there just isn't enough area to move it around. And actually, I think what happened was there's a little hole in the middle of Tom's plate. So instead of you getting typical flexure where you're dropping off at the tip, it was kind of sagging in the middle, which I think works as well, but maybe sort of not the design part of it. And finally, hopefully Tom can shed some light on uh, what these do and don't do. My understanding is they will detect local area holes, but they do not detect overall flatness. But a lot of times what I've seen is that that's the problem you have is surface plates have holes in them where somebody did work on it, whether it was normal work with metrology and they just wore it out or abusive work, sandpaper, hammering, doing something in a localized area. So flatness is, I think, sort of a sum of the parts. So this won't tell you flatness, but it'll give you a really good idea of, and you could create, say, like a plot point of what the repeater meter tells you. So again, for, you know, maybe 150 bucks in materials, including the gauge, I think we've got one of these. Take it away, Tom. Thanks for your help. Come on back, folks, after Tom's video, and we'll make one of these up.